Well, praise the Lord, here we are, another Thursday evening, and I'm so excited about it. I love Thursdays. Thursdays are great. They're my most favorite day of the week, and I know, I tell you guys all the time, it's not because, uh, you know, it's not Friday because it's payday or Saturday because we're home, but it's Thursday because we get the opportunity to uh, come into the Lord's round table and see what the Lord has for us. So I'd like to welcome each and every one that's calling in through the Lord's Round Table. And for those that are listening, whatever part of this world that you're standing in right now, uh, it's my privilege and honor to open the door and to welcome each and every one of you in. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve, and I'm the doorman. And, uh, and again, it's an awesome privilege to uh, have that title and to have that, uh, you know, to have that job, to be able to open the door to each and every one of you as, as you come in this evening. Uh, some of you who are follow the Lord's Round Table, our brother that's with us tonight is not a stranger. He's been here before, and uh, I'm sure you'll all remember him because uh, of the response that we got the first time he was on. But our brother Steve is with us. And uh, you know what? I used to know how to introduce him, but he's had some changes in his life here lately. So you know what, Brother Steve? I'm just going to turn it over to you, and uh, I'm going to sit back well, and awesome. enjoy what you got for us tonight. So, Brother, it's all yours. Well, praise, absolutely, praise God. And thank you again, Brother Steve, for having me on the Lord's Roundtable. Uh, yeah, my name is Stephen Thomas. Uh, I am now a pastor at Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, and I am just honored to be with you guys tonight. So welcome, and just thank you guys for being a part of the conversation uh, that I'm hoping to just start tonight with a lot of you guys. So just a quick disclaimer, um, we will be talking about sexual purity, pornography, uh, and lust, and then how it relates to the Bible, and then we as Christians, what is our response to that? So today we're going to talk about a topic that a lot of people shy away from. It may be uncomfortable, but it's a conversation that we need to have. So this is a conversation that you need to have, not just by here listening here, but you need to have follow-up conversations with those in your family, uh, with your friends that you're close to. Um, no matter where you're at, whether you're quarantined or social distancing still, please just jump on a phone call and just talk to somebody. So what we'll be hitting on uh, in the next couple of minutes here is, again, lust, pornography, and sexual sin. So this is something that's hurting so many of y'all, and it's probably been a struggle for so long in your life that you don't even notice anymore. So what I want to do is just to start this conversation, I want to help give you what we're going to have some action points today. And what I've called this program is the war plan. So what is our war plan against this sin? And it's to help you to fight and to show you that you're also not alone in this battle. So this is a, just a great way to start fighting. There's so many other great resources out there. Uh, and some of those resources are, if you look up uh, a resource called Proven Men, uh, if you Google that, you'll find just phenomenal studies and everything else. Covenant Eyes is also a great tool that you can use uh, in helping to fight this. So the first time that I saw a pornographic image uh, was when I was in the sixth grade. So I remember... Uh, a kid on my Little League baseball team, he was talking about a naked girl, and he saw on his computer the other day, and all of them were sitting around, and they were listening to this kid tell this story. And I remember when he asked me if I've ever seen a naked girl, I said no. And the entire dugout erupted into laughter and started just ridiculing me and making fun of me because of that. And I remember that just crushing me. So, again, I grew up in India the early part of my life, so... When we came over to America and we made that transition, I was a little bit different from everybody else. So I was just trying to fit in, trying to find my way. So I always wanted to prove myself, not just that weird little foreign kid. Later that day when I got home, I went to the computer and I typed in naked girls. And immediately images popped up. And I told myself I needed to find out what they were talking about so I could prove myself strong. But little did I know that that time I had made myself weak by wounding myself. So pornography has become such a rampant problem within our culture. It's become something that is just a part of many conversations or a part of our lives to the point that we aren't even convicted of it anymore. It's worked its way into many different parts of our lives that we don't even notice. It. We're like, oh, it's just that one scene in the movie or it's just that TV show, but the plot, it's so amazing. It's just that small part. Or when you're on Instagram or any other form of social media, you're like, well, nobody's naked or nobody's having sex, so it's fine. But we find ourselves, what, continuing to justify the things in our lives. So 
because we're causing ourselves to fall to lust rather than putting them to death in our lives. So when I meet with people nowadays, I don't ask the question, is pornography something you're struggling with? I ask them now, what is the, when was the first time you saw pornography? And what is your current relationship with pornography? So we aren't willing to lay it down or cut it off because we have too much value on it and we fear that there's something that we're missing. So the men uh, that helped me in making this resource for the guys that we've been working with, uh, their names are Kyle and Dylan, just two great friends of mine. And they went and looked up some Barna studies, uh, and here's what they found. They found that teens and young adults have encouraging or accepting conversations towards porn. Uh, when they talk about porn with their friends, 89% of teens, 95% of young adults, say they do so in a neutral or an accepting and encouraging way. That is only 1 in 20 young adults and 1 in 20 and 10 teenagers think that viewing pornography is a bad thing. So again, just all these statistics you can look up that you're continuing to see, but the reason that I focus on teens and young adults uh, so much is because, again, they, they started so many times when they were kids. And again, it's rampant here and it's continuing to grow, and then when they become adults, it's just something that's a part of them that they're not even wanting to fight anymore. So I wish that I could tell you that this problem isn't happening within the body of Christ. But so many of the men that I speak with are Christian young men. And they feel like they're never going to have freedom from it in their lives. Just look at all the things that we were talking about. Um, many of those stats apply to the church. So other studies showed that regular pornography uses increases infidelity by 300%. 40 million Americans are regularly visiting porn sites. Every second, $3,075.64 are being spent on pornography. And the Internet users, 28,258, uh, are viewing porn every second. So, so many of us get caught up in the lie that this isn't affecting anyone but ourselves, but we forget that every time we view it, we are supporting the industry with our approval, with our precious time, and with the use of people for pleasure. Abuse and the list goes on and on. So this fuels what they do and the cycle continues. Because of that support every day, more and more children are being introduced to pornography at a younger age. Innocent children who have no idea what's just been introduced to them and that the effect that it will have on them the rest of their lives. So the people that are in pornography, they're valuable to God. They are made in the image of God and Jesus came for them the same way he came for you but you rejoice and you find pleasure in their pain and sin. We have to put a stop to this in our lives to help others so this won't be a wound for you any longer or if you're leading your family for your children and your future generations as well. Take this conversation seriously. So you may be thinking, oh, I'm not addicted. I just, I just view it every now and then. Um, but you have that access in your life. And eventually it could lead into a habit, and then a habit into an addiction. So your pride is telling you that this isn't a problem that you could ever fall to. When do habits become addiction? When the brain believes that a harmful substance is beneficial. Habits become addictions. So this is due to a, uh, a connection in the brain, and it rewires a bad habit as useful and vital to the user uh, in certain circumstances. Addictions also reveal themselves the addict or the abuser's relationships. So there may be conflict or negative impacts on the family, spiritual relationships, and friendships. So this isn't just a spiritual problem, it's a mental and a physical problem as well. You may not think that this is a bad thing or a problem because you've gotten to the point in your life and your brain is telling you that it's good and something you need, and you're like, ah, I hear you, man, but honestly it sounds like everything you're talking about deals with the future and not right now. So again, this is a problem that we need to address. Don't keep putting it off because I'm telling you, the more that you do so, the more that you are rewiring your brain um, to just in, enjoy the things that it shouldn't that are, again, actually breaking you down on the inside. So Matthew 5, 27 through 30, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks on a, at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery uh, with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown in hell. 
And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than the whole body going to hell. So what I want to focus on is that we are soldiers in God's army. And the enemy is trying his best to take you off of that battlefield. So in this strange season of COVID and the strange season of social distance and everything else, he's trying to attack you even more to keep you from being as effective as you could be. So the first step in this battle is laying down your pride and admitting that this is something that you struggle with or fall to. You cannot confess to God or others what you aren't first willing to admit to yourself. You may be thinking, God doesn't care about one soldier. Do you even know your value? You are valuable to God. Let's break it down here in First Chronicles 22, 14. So, with great pains I have provided for the house of the Lord, 100,000 talents of gold, a million talents of silver, and bronze, and iron beyond weighing. For there is so much of it, timber and stone too I have provided. To this, these you must add. So let's break this down. 100,000 talents of gold uh, is all that I want to talk about right here. So one talent is equal to 75 pounds. So in gold alone, the temple was worth 700 million or 7 million 500,000 uh, pounds of gold. So there's 16 ounces in a pound, which equals 120 million ounces of gold. So currently, um, a couple weeks ago when I looked this up, gold was at $1,674 per ounce. So in today's value, just in gold alone, the temple, it was $200,880,000,000. So this is just gold, not including the silver, the bronze, the iron, the timber, and the stone. So right a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, the richest man in the world was Jeff Bezos, right? So he's the CEO of Amazon, and at the time he was worth about $113.9 billion. In gold alone, the temple is worth more than all the money that Jeff Bezos had. So in the Old Testament, the temple is where God met with the priests and where God met with his people. Remember, God owns all that's in the world and all that's on the earth, but he sent his son for you. So we are more valued than the temple because God gave his only begotten son to die for you and your sin. So in the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people, but now in the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. Do you see how valuable you are? Do you see the value that God put on the temple in the Old Testament, the the amount of resources that went into that? And now when you believe in Christ, when you have recognized that you are a sinner saved only by grace, the living God lives inside of you because you are the temple. So he gave us Jesus to die for each of us. The one who created everything sent his only son for us. That means He values you more than all the riches that it took to make that temple. So we are the temple. And we see this where? In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, ESV. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have found from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body, the value of Christ. So this is... Is how much God values he gave his only son to die as a perfect sacrifice so you don't have to be a slave to sin any longer. But you're believing the lie that you're worthless and that you will never overcome this and that God can't use you. But once you put your faith in Jesus and you believe you have that victory, there's nothing else you have to do. All you have to do is repent of your sins and believe that Jesus is Lord and the victory is yours. Because of these truths we see in Corinthians and throughout the Bible, you are not your own anymore. You are the temple of God, so glorify him in it. We were bought with a price, and now we aren't slaves to sin anymore, but we are slaves to Christ, being set free from our old selves. So you are the temple because you are Christ, and you are no longer your own. So let's think about this practically. When you know the opinion of someone who values you, the opinions of others become worthless. But this is only if you also put value in the one that values you. So let's think of it this way. If you ever played sports growing up, uh, I did when I was in high school, and I loved every minute of it, but it was different when your, when your girlfriend came to your game. You know what I'm talking about. You got a little bit more swag in your step, uh, and you just, you just were like, oh, man, I got to show out tonight. 
So you would do everything with just a little bit more smoothness. You were trying to make sure that people saw it was like you weren't even trying, but you were still amazing. And then you end up, let's say in the game, you got that last shot and you drained it. And after everything, everyone was telling you how amazing you did. At the end of the day, the only person you wanted to hear from was your girlfriend. Why? So you're sitting there, you're waiting, and you finally hear from her. And that mattered so much because you knew it was genuine and you knew it was real. She wasn't just being nice, uh, but she really meant it. And you knew this because you knew her. So the creator of the universe values you so much more than that girl ever could. Yet we would rather have the approval and the validation of the world than the truth that we know to be true about God. You are so valuable that he doesn't want to leave you where you're at. God wants to take you back on the battlefield. So this is a reminder. No one has ever sinned themselves beyond the love of God. You're letting others uh, who value nothing put value on you. So a couple months ago, I was reading through Ecclesiastes, and this was kind of the summary that I had right here, was you're letting others who value nothing put value on you. You're striving for things and goals that have no value. And once you reach them, you feel nothing. But there is one that knows your value, that has always known your value. And once you realize that, vanity will fade and truth will remain. What is that truth? That truth is Jesus Christ. And the only thing that will satisfy you is God. So if you're trying to satisfy yourself with anything else, it will never fill your appetite. So it's not just enough to confess sin. You have to forsake it. Um, there's an old hymn. It's called, My Worth is Not in What I Own. And every verse of that song comes back to the cross. Let me read you those lyrics. My, ver my worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or loss, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul, and I will trust in Him no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. To wanders here that I confess my worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. And the cross is the ultimate example of your worth and your unworthiness. No value can you bring on your own to God to earn His favor. Your ultimate value is because God gave His only Son. And it's in Him alone that you have value. That you've been trying to fulfill your desires apart from God, and they will never satisfy. So I'm encouraging you to lay your sin at the cross and let that song ring true in your heart. That that chorus one more time is, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul, and I will trust in Him no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. So, as we're fighting these things, we have to continue to run back to the source. It's another story that we see in Scripture. It's your sin isn't the thing that always convicts you. Where do we see this? We see this with Peter when Jesus tells him what? You will deny me three times. And Peter's like, no, not me, Lord. I'll stay faithful, everything else, and then what happens? Time passes, and Peter denies it. More time goes, he denies him again. So again, if he had realized what he would have done the first time, he wouldn't have done it again. But then we see again the third. But when does Peter finally remember when that rooster crows and he remembers what his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ told him. When the rooster crows, he will deny me three times. And that's when he broke down. So again, he remembered it when he remembered the words of God Almighty. So in, in this war plan, continue to be in the Word of God. Continue to run to Him and to seek the truth. Because the further that you get away from the source the easier it is for you to convince yourself that these things are all right. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Run from sexual sin. No other sin clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. 
In the ESV, it says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual immoral person sins against his own body. So listen, temptation is trying to fulfill a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. So how do we run? How do we run this race? We have to cut off the things that are causing you to fall. So what are those things that are causing you to fall? Is it social media? Is it Netflix? Is it movies? Is it bad friends? Is it your phone? Is it your access to the Internet? I'm asking you, what is it for you? You have to be aware. So compromise happens when you don't know where you stand and you're ignorant of the truth. He came to bring you from what? From death to life. And we forget that so often, and we return to the very thing that's hurting us the most. What do you find comfort in? Is it food, friends, hobbies, your phone when you're in a new place? It all comes down to control most of the time. So we feel the need to maintain power over nearly every aspect of our lives, including personal, romantic relationships, family dynamics, events in the workplace, whatever that is. But 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. But we have to win the fight every day. We do that by fleeing and admitting there is nothing that we can do on our own. So what do we need to do in order to vacate? We must be aware of what's causing you to stumble to that sin. You must be aware of the things that are in your life. Is it things that are causing you, pulling you down? Is it spiritual or is it physical? Aware of who you are because of Christ. So that action step again is run away. When you're in these moments of temptation, turn off your phone. Get away from the TV. Get Walk away from those conversations. But then how do we do this? We don't do this alone. We do this again with the power of the Holy Spirit, but we do this also with other believers. I'm encouraging you so much. Run with friends in this. Run with people of God. I don't know if any of you else are out there, uh, there you're kind of like me, but I absolutely despise running. But you know what's the one place that I have no problem running? It's when I'm playing basketball with a bunch of my friends. Half the time when I'm done, I'm looking at my watch and I've tracked it and I've ran almost eight miles. There's no way I would ever have ran eight miles on my own if you just told me to go run a circle. But again, when I'm with friends and I'm enjoying that time and they're the ones pushing me and continue to do all these things, I go a lot further than I do if I would have just been alone. But there's a story in the Bible that is very similar to this strange season that we're all in. A story of a man uh, who, in a season of his life, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. Does that sound familiar? I think early last year, a lot of us were in a place that we weren't normally. We were probably sitting at home. If we weren't sitting at home, we weren't able to go out and do all these things. And the story that I'm talking about is the one in 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 4. So here it is. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. And they destroyed the Ammonite army, and they laid siege to the city of Rehob. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Verse 2. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. And as he overlooked the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. The translation, she was beautiful. He sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. Wait. So when kings were supposed to be out at war, David sent Joab and his army off, and he just chilled back at the crib. Okay, okay. He decided to stay back, which is fine. But he's still working, right? He's still running the kingdom? Nope. It says that he was resting midday. In verse 2, late one afternoon when David arose from his couch in the ESV. How many of you out there am I describing? You don't have 
the normal rhythm, the normal things that you used to do and everything else. So now you're just being content and you're being um, unstimulated from what you're doing. But what do you, what do you, what were you probably saying? You're like, Oh, I love being at home. I love doing these things. I have so much time to learn new things to read. You probably like, Oh, I'm going to pick up painting. And maybe you even ordered one of those paid by numbers that you saw on the internet. And then you worked on it really hard for like two hours, but you haven't touched it since. So back then you said you were going to do all of these things, but the reality is most likely you just sat around and binge watched a lot of TV. So right now, a lot of you guys are where you shouldn't be. You're out of the normal rhythm that you normally should be in the spring. This is your reality. Now, how are you going to make the best of it? Are you going to stay on task and not get lazy? Or are you just going to fall right back into your old way? So many of you don't struggle with the sexual sin and pornography and everything else when you're at work and you're living your lives and everything else, not because you've dealt with the issue, but because you're busy. So as soon as you get free time, what happens? You normally fall right back into those bad old habits. So let's look back at David. So he wasn't where he was supposed to be, did something he shouldn't have done, and caused many people to lose things that they shouldn't have. So when do so many of us fall? It's when we're bored and we're not engaged in anything. So when David should have been at war, he stayed at home. David, a man after God's own heart, who nearly has a thousand verses written about him, is remembered so often by a couple of verses that talk about his sin. When I say David and, what happens? A lot of you guys fill it in in your head. Bathsheba. And that's what we remember so often. So he sought this sin out. He was tempted and he could have left the roof and not fixated his mind on her. But instead, he involved others in his sins. He sent for someone to find her. You're like, oh, that's different from pornography. Like, that, it's just me. No, it's not just you. You're helping fuel the sex trafficking industry, and you're involving so many others in your sin every time you click on an image or a video. So the first time you saw a pornographic image, um, slept with somebody that wasn't your wife outside of marriage, you were wounded. And you will continue to injure yourself every single time that you engage in any sexual activity outside of marriage. There's a thrill and there's a desire for those things. Again, temptation is trying to fulfill a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. So once you've tried to fulfill that desire in an illegitimate way, there's a feeling of shame, guilt, and disgust. And you don't uh, want anyone to know, so you hide it. But where does sin grow the best? In isolation. So again, your pride doesn't want you to know, doesn't want anyone to know. So you pray to God after you've sinned and say, God, uh, please rid me of this desire. Please take it away, completely rid it of my life. Then you get freedom from it for one or two days and you end up going right back to where you know, where you were. So I've noticed in the Christian community, uh, particularly, we're good at admitting it. We're good at then confessing it. And man, uh, after that, there's this relief from our guilt. Uh, and that we need it, so we just leave it at that. But then we fall again, and you make the same mistake, and then you confess, and then it happens over and over again. Why? Because we never ran from what was causing us to stumble. We got all the relief we wanted by just confessing it and asking these things, but we never addressed the issue because we didn't actually want to give up the thing that we love so much. That's why we have to flee from sexual immorality. Put to death our old self and put on the new in Christ. So I'm telling you, there's some action steps that you can take. You can put content blockers on your phones, on your laptops. Delete apps on your phone that don't need to be there. Don't keep the thing that is wounding you day after day in your life. Flee from it. Rid it of your life. So you have to be aware that you're sinning. Confess it to God and to each other and run from those things that trigger you and seek the face of God every single day. So when an athlete is injured, what happens? They take time to get better. Many times people say they were never the same after that one injury. A relationship or a marriage isn't going to fix this problem. You are dealing with an injury that hasn't healed yet. You're overly confident that you got it, and that is when you're most likely to get hurt. So one of the greatest golfers and possibly greatest master of their craft 
at their peak was who? Tiger Woods. He was doing things on the golf course that no one has ever seen. He was breaking records, racial barriers, doing things in golf at the level that has been unmatched even to this day. When he was at the peak of his career, he thought he was untouchable and he could do no wrong. But because of this, he started compromising in areas of his life, especially when it came to women. He eventually was found out and his life came what crashing down around him. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. This was me for the longest time. I got this. No one needs to know. I'll come out on the other side. But what did it take? It took someone else saying something to me to be confronted with this. It took another man to get David there as well. So when Nathan came to David and told him about a man who had many sheep and cattle and took a sheep from a man who had one, David was enraged and wanted that man to die. Then Nathan told David, that man in the story is you. Nathan said, why do you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You did it in secret. But I will do this in broad daylight before all Israel. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan responded to him and said, the Lord has taken your sin away. You are not going to die, but by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord. The son born to you will die. So you may be stopping the blessing that God wants for you. God didn't want David to have a son that died. But David chose to defy God and fulfill his pleasure his own way. God did not forsake him. He forgave him. But that doesn't mean that there weren't any repercussions because of his sin. Look why he is considered a man after God's own heart. Psalm 32, 5. Finally, I confess all my sins to you. I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me, and all my guilt is gone. So if David would have fled, he would have never caused great pain to himself, others around him, and someone wouldn't have been an accomplice to murder, Uriah wouldn't have had to die, Bathsheba wouldn't have committed adultery, and an innocent child wouldn't have had to die. Sin has a way of growing when you try to hide it and cover it up. So if I have a cut on my arm and I didn't take the proper steps to take care of it, what's going to happen? It's going to get infected, and I could end up losing my whole arm. So all wounds have a risk of being infected, no matter the size. If they're not taken care of and they're not bandaged up and taking time to heal. So David was considered a man after God's own heart because when he was confronted with his sin, he repented. I'm encouraging you to confess to God, to confess to those trusted people, get rid of those things that are causing you to stumble and get the help that you need. Let the goodness of God heal the wound. Will it be easy? No. With Christ, there is freedom and joy. So again, today, this conversation is just a small step in the beginning of healing. Victory is being faithful and be and obedient today. So what are we going to do? Vacate from those sins. Flee from sexual sins. Don't stand and fight it because you will lose that battle over and over again. So the action steps that I want to leave you with here today when it comes to fighting this sin is to read, pray, fast, unite, and repeat. Read. Okay, you have a hard time reading the Word of God? Let me give you something really practical. For the next 21 days, read one chapter a day in the Gospel of John. Again, we seek the face of God. We seek His Word so that it continues to reveal the things in our lives that we need to surrender to Him. Pray. Prayer is not a passive thing. So pray intentionally and pray boldly for the things that you need from God. Then what are you going to do? I'm asking you to fast for the next 21 days from those things that cause you to stumble. So identify those things after this. Take time to sit down and write it out. What are the things that cause you to fall to sexual sin? And then take those out of your life. So listen, fasting isn't about what you're abstaining from but it's about what you're replacing it with and what are we replacing it with, with the word of God and time in his presence. 
And then that last one, unite. Don't do this alone. Have this conversation with somebody. And then continue to hold each other accountable. I want you know, the next 21 days, every three days, see if you can get on a phone call. See if you can meet them in person. Ask them very intentional questions and have them ask you very intentional questions about your struggle. And again, continue to fight this battle. And then what's the very last step? It's to repeat it. So continue to do this all the days of your life. So again, for me, I continue to have content blockers on my phone, on my laptop, on everything else. And I continue to meet up with people so that this isn't something that I continue to fall to. It's not something that I've struggled with for a very long time, but it doesn't mean that I'm not susceptible of the sin. Take the measures that you need to. Understand how serious sin is and flee and run from it. But then remember again those beautiful, beautiful lyrics from that song. It's all taken care of at the cross. So I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. And I will trust in Him, no other. My, satisfy, my soul is satisfied in Him alone. And I love you guys so much, and I pray that you continue to run to God with all of your hurts, and you let him heal those. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you again for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you um, just for Christian community, God. And I pray that those who are lacking that, that they are able to get plugged into their local church. I pray that they can reach out to the Lord's roundtable. And again, just start this process of just fighting sin and growing closer to you, God. Lord, I love you, and I thank you, and I pray all these things in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. 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 You know, brother, that's a powerful message, and it's one that, you know, as we was talking a little bit there in the beginning, uh, you know, it's something that attacks the trucking industry big time. You know, for one, yeah. uh, we see this, you know, I think one of the reasons being is, the, one of the main reasons is, you know, the the loneliness you you don't have that home time and yeah. uh, you know you're you got too many things to uh too much downtime to get a hold of your thoughts the other thing i yeah. i believe and you know we're talking to different drivers that causes them to stumble in this is the simple fact that they're not at home and their fear of getting caught seems to lessen the further away from home that they are but unfortunately yeah. You're not going to hide your sins. Your sins will be found out. They're going to come out sooner or later. Yep. It's going yeah. to surface. And yeah, then it's absolutely. Going to make, yeah, then it's going to make things worse. And besides, yeah. you know, you might be a, you might be away from your family where they can't see what you're up to in that, but you're not away from God, and God sees it. Yeah. And then, you know. And, absolutely. And, so that's the thing that, like, with this, listen, honestly, you could get away with this your entire life, but one day there is a judgment day. Amen. One day you will hold account to everything. So it's like, listen, you could be amazing at hiding this. You could be amazing at everything else. But I'm telling you, and I'm pleading with you that it's not about the other people's perception. It's about your faithfulness to God and what he's called you to do. So literally, what do we see so many times? We've seen so many pastors and so many spiritual leaders and so many people fall to all these different sexual sins and everything else. Giftedness does not mean faithfulness. What is God asking us to be? He's asking us to be faithful. Amen. So again, what does it look like for us today to obey and to follow his word and again to put to death our old self and put on our new selves in Christ? Amen. Amen. And you know, and, and being in the word of God and walking close with God, you know, and, and having that relationship with Jesus Christ, you know, because it, it's constantly going to come to your mind, you know, if you're in the word where he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You know, if you love me, you'll hate Amen. sin. And when you get caught up in these yeah. sins, the first thing that <clears throat> that jumps in is guilt. And that guilt then right behind yeah. the guilt is Satan. You know, say it is demons. You know, remind it, look at you. And you're a Christian? How can you pray? How can you talk to people? How can you yeah. do this? How can you yeah. do that? You know, and, and so it's, yeah. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people out here that get involved in uh, pornography and things of that nature. And it's a rough battle. It's it's nothing taken lightly. You know, I knew a gentleman. Uh, yeah, he's, no. he's gone to be with the Lord. Uh, he had he has a huge ministry that follows him, 
you know, there's people that have picked up his torch and, and continues to go on with it. But I was eating dinner with him one time, and he told me, he says, uh, you know, when he come to know the Lord, he was a drunk, he was a drug addict, and he was addicted to pornography. And he says shortly yeah. after uh, coming to know the Lord, you know, he had realized that his drug addiction and his alcoholism had disappeared. But he had struggling, mm-hmm. still struggling with pornography. And one day he broke down in yeah. tears and he said, Lord, you delivered me from the rest of it. How come you haven't delivered me from the pornography? And he said, the Lord laid it mm-hmm. on his heart. It's because you don't want to let it go yet. There's a, still a part of you that yeah. wants to hold on to it. And I think that that yeah. comes from what you were talking about with what triggers yeah. that. You know, what do you allow yourself yeah. to watch, you know? And, and, and you know, yeah. I had to laugh when you said that about uh, – well, it's just a small part in the movie. Basically, it's a good movie. Yeah. It just had that one. We've all said it. I've said it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same. But again, it's just, it, it's allowing. The, so if you go and look in the Old Testament and you see with Pharaoh when the plagues are coming, the plagues of the frogs come, right? And then he's pleading with Moses. But if you look in the text there in Exodus, it says, he says, just one more day. So it's like he's not asking for relief even from his turmoil that day. Right. He's telling Moses, like, I can stand this one more day and then tomorrow <laughs> then bring that relief. But again, that's what happens so many times with us. We're just so stubborn and we continue to harden our heart to these things to where, again, we're just like, okay, I'm going to put it off. Like, I can survive this one more day. Yeah, God will deliver me, but let that be tomorrow. Today I'm going to continue to be where I'm at. Right, right. But again, we see what happens in that story. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> you know, so it's, it's funny. That I think you... the prayer. The, yeah. No, no, go on, go on. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say just the, the prayer that I'm just praying for so many. And the prayer that I had to pray for myself is just that God would soften my heart. And every day I pray that God continues to soften my heart and not let lets me harden my heart to any sin in my life. Um, so again, I pray that I continue to, again, what does it say in Matthew 5? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Amen. Why are you mourning? Because you're broken over your sin. Amen. Um, so, yeah. What were you saying? You know, the funny thing about it, you know, using David as your, you know, your topic there, you know, using him as your example, I, I was putting together a message where I was using that same scenario, but it was how sin is progressive and how, you know, just yeah. a glance and then staring a little longer, yeah. and then planning how sin continues to yeah. progress, because it doesn't stay satisfying to you, you know, and, and it's like right. with pornography, you know, you, you see something, and it grabs your attention, but it progresses, you got to go a little bit further than that, and a little bit further than that, and then the next thing you know, you find yourself, you can't even get through a day without being on the internet looking at, you know, stuff that you shouldn't be looking at. Yeah, and then again, I think, uh, um, that when I was in Ecclesiastes, I think puts it just so beautifully. But again, that summary that I have there of the book of Ecclesiastes, after Solomon has tried all these things, what's happening? You're letting others who value nothing put value on you, and you're striving for goals that have no value. And guess what? When you reach them, you feel nothing. <laughs> but there is one that knows your value, has always known your value, and once you realize that, that vanity will fade and only truth will remain. And that truth is Jesus Christ. Amen. And only God will satisfy. Amen. Amen. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Well, brother, it's been awesome. And as always, you know, we enjoy you being here. Um, you know, we know that what you bring us is what the Lord gives you. You know, I was telling a pastor the other day, I says, you can tell the difference between a message a pastor came up with and a message that he got from the Lord. You know, it's got that anointing on it, and it, and it hits. It's just not a bunch of words that are being thrown out to occupy a little bit of time. But it's words that pierces your heart, and it gets you thinking about the things in your own life. And I'll tell you, you know, whether it's uh, sexual addiction or alcohol or drugs, we all struggle with stuff. I don't think there's anybody that's free of it. Yeah. You know, even getting addicted yeah. into, you know, yeah. your, yourself, you know, and what you are to you. You know, and we know that just turns yeah. into idol worship. But, uh, you know, so a yeah. message such as you yeah. brought is one that we definitely need to hear. And it's something that we need to hear on a regular basis. Because, you know, it's yeah. <laughs> what's funny about it is 
you know, whether whether it's a, a sex addiction or a drug addiction or whatever it is, you know, you'll be sitting there going, I'm going to fight this, I'm going to fight this. But then once it starts to uh, come together in your mind, then it overwhelms and progresses at such a rapid rate of speed that before you realize that you're so caught up in it. And then now here you are starting yeah. all over again. And that's hard. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. And I think, again, like we have to be specific um, with our confession and specific with our like knowing what are the things that cause us to stumble. I think so many times, especially in the church, uh, I feel like what we hear is just like your sins are forgiven. But then it's just like when you say that, like for you, what are your sins? I'm not a Catholic, but, like, one thing that I do appreciate is, like, in their confession, they're confessing exactly what it is. Right. When I'm talking to a lot of people now, they just like, God, forgive me of my sin today. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Amen. Right, right. right. They don't get so specific. Like, what, what, what was the sin? What was the <laughs> sin that you committed today? How can you then continue to fight that, that battle if you're not even willing to address what that is? Right. So then you can't. Uh, confess it to God what you're first not willing to admit to yourself. So right. I think this is a problem that so many times you're like, okay, nobody knows about this. Uh, nobody has access to these things. Only I know. I'm only hurting myself. But again, you're involving so many others. And again, like we talked about, you're fueling that uh, industry that, again, is promoting sex trafficking and everything else. That's so right. it's, it's, again, just like you were talking about that sermon you're creating, it all just compounds on itself over and over. So it's, again, lay it down at the cross. Let um, the precious blood of Jesus cover those sins, but again, confess those sins specifically. Know what those thorns in your flesh are so that you, again, can be in accountability with other believers and you, again, continue to run and fight this race every single day. Amen. You think maybe sometimes people don't want to address them specifically because they just flat out don't want to hear it come out of their mouth, that they're so ashamed of it, so disappointed, they don't even want to speak it. They're good with, Lord, yeah. just forgive my sins. Right, yeah. And again, that's that shame part of it. And again, that victory and that freedom and that release from guilt and shame only comes when you surrender it. Um, so again, like like you were saying before, we just want to hold on to it just a little bit longer. Right. We just want to, okay, if I, and then, hey, like I'll say that prayer, like I'll confess a general sin, because if I say it specifically, then that means that I'm that. Right. And again, I think I even broke it down a little bit in the message. It's like, well, I'm not addicted. I just like sometimes like, yeah. it's just like, what, what is that? Like, what do you mean? Like you're allowing something that is literally killing you to continue to be in your life. Right. Um, so. See, and that's the whole thing, too. When you get caught up in these sins like that, it, it separates that fellowship that you have with the Lord. Not that he broke it off, but yeah. you, you just don't feel worthy. You don't you feel guilty. That, you know, God don't want to listen to me right now. You know, maybe I'll be able to pray and, and talk to him tomorrow. Yeah. Yep. But, and we know yeah. where that Again, comes from. Again, for anybody from. listening, uh, yeah, yeah. But for anybody listening, I was just going to encourage you, like, today is the day I think you can start um, this conversation with God and this conversation with others. Um, again, you have access to the internet a great great website is a website called proven men they have this study that again it's like a 12-week study um that just helps you in this battle and gives you practical steps and everything else um but yeah you need you need to take action steps you can't just be passive about it um because if you just sit there hoping that you're going to win the battle and you're not even fighting then you're never going to win right 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 if you want change you got to be changed but on the other side of that, that is the glory and the beauty that is Jesus, because, listen, we're going to fight and we're going to fail. Right. But he already has given us the victory. Amen. We already know the outcome. But That's now, right. because we love him, we keep his commandments. That's right. That's right. Because we have been transformed, now we're putting to death the old. So this isn't disqualifying you. But what I'm saying, telling you is that, like, as you're continuing in, in your walk with the Lord, as you're continuing in sanctification, now you have to continue to put to death the things that were of your old. Um, and God has grace, and God has freedom, and God has victory in that. 
Amen. But you have to bring that in total surrender to him. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. Well, praise the Lord again. You know, I, I just enjoy so much talking with you and, and listening to you, you know, because it's definitely a true word. It's anointed word. And uh, we appreciate you so much, Steve. We really do. Well, thank you, Brother Steve, and your faithfulness week in and week out. I know so many people uh, are encouraged by you. And, again, continue to pray for you and just thankful for the ministry that God's given you. Well, I definitely appreciate your prayers. And you know how it is on the Lord's Roundtable. Before we sign off, we got to pray for you. Amen? Amen. Well, Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for this evening. And, Lord, every time we come to the Lord's Roundtable, you always show us something that it's not a... Lord, this is not for entertainment. Your table and those that you bring and the messages that are being delivered are for our walk with you, our true life with you, not for entertainment's sake, but to be an encouragement and to help us to change our lives, to conform more into your likeness. And I praise you for that, Lord. I praise you for the doors that you have opened for the Lord's round table, such as our brother Steve, that he comes out of his busy day and he shares with us. And, and Lord, I just appreciate that so much. I pray, Father, your hedge of protection around him and his family. I pray for his dad and his mom. And, and what what a mighty, mighty uh, man and woman of God. And, and Lord, what an example for all of us. And I praise you for that. And I pray you protect them, Lord. I pray no hurt or harm or wicked or evil thing will come against them. I pray, Father God, that you, any sicknesses that might be, that known or unknown to them, that as Jehovah Rapha, you lay your healing hand upon them. And, Father, I pray that as my brother Steve, the different levels that you've taken him to and the different doors that you've opened up for him, and it's because he's faithful. And when you say that you're faithful with little, that you'll give much. And, Lord, you're, you're, you're giving them much. And I, and I just, Lord, it's just so exciting and awesome to see. And I pray, Father, that you continue to open doors for him. And I pray, Lord, that, that he continues, and I know he will, but to have ears to hear as your Holy Spirit speaks to him. So, Father, I pray for each and every driver out here on the highway tonight. I pray safe travels for them. I pray, Lord God, that as this week is winding down, that they'll be able to go home and, and spend some time with their families. I pray, Father, that the endeavors that they have out here, Lord, will be enough to, to uh, take care of the financial needs that they have at home, Lord. But, Father, most importantly of it all, you don't have us all out here running up and down the highways doing these things to get this done. You have us out here to go out into the highways and the hedges and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, for each and every one that's here tonight. I pray for their families. I pray for their friends and their friends' families, that for those that are lost and without Jesus Christ, that today would be that day of salvation for them. Your word said that today is the day of salvation because tomorrow's not promised to us. And, and, and every driver out here knows that the next turn in the road could be our last one. And you don't even have to be a driver to to be a, a part of that, no matter what industry that we're in, Lord. It, the next second could be our last one before we even finish here tonight. We could hear the sound of that trumpet and be out of here. But, Father God, we just pray that we will have a heart for the lost, that we'll not just talk about or talk about the lost, but we'll talk to them, Lord, to, again, share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you for this evening. I thank you for my brother. I thank you, Father God, for his dedication to you, his obedience to you. And, Lord, I give you all the praise, all the glory and honor. And there is only one name that we come to you by. There is only one name that we pray by. And that's the name that causes demons to run in fear. (laughs) Hallelujah. And that's the name of Jesus. So, Father God, we love you. We give you praise, glory, and honor. And uh, with that, we say amen, amen. And I pray again for each and every one out here that, uh, you know, and I I just want to say this briefly to all that are listening. You know, you heard my brother speaking here tonight. And, you know, when we get into troubles, you know, we run to God. You know, when we need strength, we run to our Lord, you know, because he strengthens us and he empowers us and he enables us. And you might be in a position where you're saying, well, hey, I don't see it in my life. I, I ask him. You know, I ask him to help me, but I don't see it in my life. But my question is to you, have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ?
The Bible says that God only hears the voice that, of those that he knows. Each and everything that we see, hear, touch, taste, and smell is created by God. They're creations of his. You're a creation of his. But when you call upon the name of Jesus Christ, you become a child of his. And then he hears your voice. Don't get me wrong. He's God. He's omnipresent. He, he's everywhere. He, he knows everything, hears everything, sees everything. It, saying that he only hears the voice of those he knows is a figure of speech. And what I am meaning by that is, I'll give you an example. If you're out mowing the grass or sitting on your front porch and some little kid comes walking up to you and says, Hey, mister, I want a new bicycle. Can you buy me a bicycle? What's the first thing you're going to say to him? Who are you? I don't know you. Where'd you come from? You from around here? It's the same way with God. Until you call upon the name of Jesus, you're just a creation of his. He doesn't know you. And it doesn't take it doesn't take going to classes, going to college, it doesn't take going to a priest, a pope, a preacher, a deacon. It don't take none of that. All it takes is a sincere heart. The Word of God says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's nothing that you can do to earn your salvation. I don't care how many times you mow the neighbor's grass, shovel driveways of snow. The Bible says that salvation is a gift of God, not of works, at least any man should boast. You can't work for your salvation. Jesus had to die on the cross of Calvary for your salvation. All you need to do is confess. And you know you're a sinner just as well the same as I do. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever lusted after the opposite sex in your heart? These are all, these are just a few of the Ten Commandments. So how good of a person are you? Because we've all fallen short of that. But all you need to do is get into a, a quiet place and just say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And as a sinner, when you die, you will go to hell. You'll hear, depart from me, you're doer of iniquity, and I know you're not. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know if I died right now, from what I'm hearing, I would go to hell. And I don't want to go to hell. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. Help me to walk the way I'm supposed to be walking. Help me to live in this world the way that you want me to because I can't do it on my own. At that moment, the Lamb's book of eternal life is opened up and your name's written down. And let me tell you something. If God writes your name down, he knows you. <laughs> he knows all about you. You don't need your name in lights. God already knows it. So I'm asking you, the greatest decision that you'll ever make is the decision for Jesus Christ. And if you think that you've got time and you don't want to make that decision yet, let me tell you something. You've already made a decision. You've made a decision not to follow Jesus Christ. And if you were to die right now, you have made a decision to go to hell. Don't want to hear, I didn't know, because I just told you. And I don't want to hear, well, if God loved me so much, why would he let me go to hell? He won't let you go to hell. You choose to go to hell by not choosing Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. It might sound a little harsh, but I'll tell you what, it's not as harsh as depart from me, you're doers of iniquity. If you have any questions, you want somebody to talk with you, somebody to pray with you, go to the thelordsroundtable.com. There's a comment tab on there, and there's also a tab for a prayer request, and my phone number is on there, and I put it on there for one specific reason, for somebody to call me. So utilize the resources that are given to you. I would love to hear from you, and I'd love to talk with you and pray with you. So with that being said, again, Steve, we love you. Appreciate you coming and visiting with us, spending some time with us. We'll definitely have to do this again. Yes, sir. Amen. Always, always an honor and always a privilege to present the Word of God. Amen. Amen. I like that. Well, with that being said, uh, just a reminder, we'll be back again tomorrow evening. And, uh, you know, we'll see what the Lord's got for us tomorrow. So God bless everybody, be safe, and look forward to talking with you again. Good night.